Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Can you feel the tremendous energy that's on campus with our faculty, staff, students, and all of our, all of our people back together? It's just remarkable to have that positive experience that we're seeing today. We have had a number of events over the last week, and those will continue as we continue to welcome the students back to the campus through Labor Day weekend with a host of different activities that are planned. And these are just uh, wonderfully positive um, drivers for us. I hope you've had the chance to relax and enjoy the summer and are arriving back on campus with renewed energy. My talk today is titled, A Focused Future, and I'd like to share with you a plan for how we will get there together. In my talk, I'm going to address four key areas. I'll talk about our purpose, people, the challenges that are ahead, and how we'll progress together, and then we'll provide time for Q&A at the end. Let's take a deep breath here. Let's stand back and recognize what a year it's been. It's been challenging, and there's no question these challenges will continue. You know, I don't think I've delivered a traditional plenary yet as I think back over the last few. Last fall, it was a year ago that I offered my first plenary, and you remember at that time, we were anticipating about $90 million in uh, addition to the UW system. I think it was a Board of Regents meeting earlier in August where there had been an endorsement of that, and all signals were pretty positive. And then in early January, there were some rumblings, and the news that uh, was, was on the docket was not at all comfortable. And I remember as I was preparing for the plenary, everything was changing day by day, and that morning of, um, the plenary, we had a completely different talk than, than uh, uh, what was delivered about seven or eight hours later. So, so things were changing, and of course since then, we have known, we have learned what, what uh, the cut is actually uh, going to be and, and uh, have been managing that throughout the year. But in truth, we didn't know until about July 12th of this summer what the actual cut would be. But there were more fundamental things than just the budget cut. There were also some, some concerns and threats to our academic freedom, to tenure, to indefinite status, to, to many of the core tenets of things that we hold dear and, and near to, to why we exist and, and what we do. And that's why I think it's so important to remind ourselves of how much we matter and why we're here. This is the foundation of a focused future. So I'm going to spend some time on that. I'm also gonna talk about the power of our people and how we will move ahead tumultuous times require significant responses. It's in this context that today, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything, I will spend a fair amount of time discussing the gravity of our financial situation and what we are doing about it, how we will proceed in the future. Let me begin with our purpose, some aspects about why we're here, reinforcing and affirming some of the things that I think are truly valued by our campus. This first slide depicts a quote, a page, if you will, from a recent report by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences titled Public Research Universities, Why They Matter. The first idea that's talked about here, public research universities initiate the fundamental research that drives scientific and technological discovery. Let me pull it out of the third person and talk about what we do. It's in this context to affirm what we do. We educate and we train. We prepare teachers and faculty. We equip the next generation of leaders. We are stewards of human knowledge. Everything we do should be evaluated in the context of why we exist. More locally, the Wisconsin idea under, underscores and affirms these ideas and gives us even more focus on why we're here. The basic principle is that the university should improve people's lives beyond the classroom. The Wisconsin idea, therefore, spans our teaching, research, engagement, and service. We will always champion the Wisconsin idea. A few days ago, Tom Still, he's the president of the Wisconsin Technology Council, he opined on UWM as well as others in the UW system. Here's a quote from his article. This is Tom Still on higher education, key for the state's economy. Doctoral campuses are research engines and producers of advanced degrees. Wisconsin must elevate UW-Milwaukee's capacity in the state's largest city and maintain excellence and access. 
attempts to standardize, to standardize missions would be stultifying and unresponsive to a changing marketplace. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate the plug. <clears throat> exactly. With our purpose established, with that as a foundation for a focused future, let's acknowledge that none of this would be possible without our people, our students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and partners. You comprise everything that we do. People comprise the largest part of our budget. Our impact is 100% people and can be seen in our student success, research excellence, and our community engagement. I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. As we consider student success, I'll discuss four important indicators. One is quality education. What happens in the classroom? What happens in the laboratory? How well we provide an education quality experience. Another is indicators of retention and graduation. Our campus will be doing more and has to do more as we enter an era that is much more metric-based, much more accountability-based. I could talk much more about that if you're interested in the Q&A in terms of some of the things that I'm seeing in Wisconsin and nationally with respect to this. But these are important for us to know how we're doing and to be able to improve in both of these areas. Preparation for life after graduation, which can mean a variety of different things. And ultimately, in what ways are we accountable for preparing students? From the UW system perspective, they have put online recently a dashboard. Some of the critical pieces of that dashboard, which we've been tracking for years and have been publishing in hard copy, but now will be available online, in addition to 20 or 21 other indicators, include our progress in terms of high impact learning and retention practices and critical thinking. These are core areas that we do very well. Enrollment updates is the second portion that I'll talk about. We have, for almost the entire enrollment cycle, experienced application and admits our admission decisions that have increased. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen that tail off and, and, and level off, and we are anticipating, though, a resulting higher enrollment than what we are currently seeing at this point. We might have a slight decline in our enrollments, and much of this comes from the yield. In other words, the yield hasn't matched historically where we have been at about the mid-40s. We're more like uh, the mid-42s at this point. This is preliminary. We'll have better numbers in the next couple of weeks as everything sorts out. Students, as you know, are still being admitted, but things are following some of the national trends. Those are discussed right here. What we know, and we've been predicting this for some time, there's no growth in 18 to 24-year-olds. That's particularly relevant for UWM, which has an average student age between 25 and 26 years old. In fact, enrollments over the last year have declined 3.8% for those 24 and above. So again, we're, we're, we're not at that point at this, at this uh, date, but we may be uh, at that. There's also declines in older student enrollments that coincide with lower unemployment rates, which we happen to be experiencing in Wisconsin which is uh, good news. On the group that's managing and helping work directly on enrollment, we have CMAT. And you'll be hearing more about CMAT. It's a group that's been in place for a year. CMAT stands for the Chancellor's Enrollment Management Action Team. This is a group that uses data for decision making. They have in place today a comprehensive retention plan. They will be working in the future on a strategic enrollment management plan. Um, and they have work groups that are focused on scholarships and advising. Shifting gears within the people section still, I'll talk just about a few key aspects of research. I mentioned earlier regarding our purpose at its core is educating students and conducting research. What brought so many of us here is our passion for research and students and how our research can have an impact at so many levels. It's critical that we continue our approach to educate students through undergraduate and graduate research. Teaching grows out of our research knowledge base and emerges through research and inquiry. This is what distinguishes us as a research university. The centrality of research can be bolstered further through collaborative interdisciplinary grant activity and partnering, some examples of which I'll give today. I want you also to know that the top tier research team has been reestablished to be a critical input for some of the planning that I'll describe as we go forward. 
I also want to mention the Kirk or the Kenwood Interdisciplinary Research Center in the context of research. This new building addresses some of UWM's most urgent STEM academic and research needs. STEM, as you know, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In my practice earlier today, I called that M management, drawing from earlier areas. So um, my bad, but uh, you all know it could be management as well. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly in the formal sense not that. This building is largely dedicated to physics, which is a large research engine for UWM in terms of both visibility and funding. There's a facility also in the building for the drug discovery group and mostly the chemistry area. Uh, and then the Zilber Science, uh, Zilber School of Public Health wet labs. There is a building dedication uh, on October 2nd, which is the beginning of our homecoming week, which will span from October 2nd through the 10th. A couple of additional ideas on why research matters. Research matters for a number of key reasons. Nationally and internationally recognized research programs produce discoveries and create new knowledge. Rebecca Clapper, it was announced this week, has received $1.2 million of a 20 million nanoparticle research grant. Wonderful news for Rebecca and UWM. There are innovations that can be commercialized and benefit our partners and society. We've recently had examples, you might have seen the media, with the work that's been done with Snap-on, some of the activities with Johnson Controls and other partners. The work that we're doing today through our clinical translation science institute with some of the key players in the medical fields, ultimately enriching students, our faculty, and our staff and society writ large. It's critical that we continue to strengthen UWM's research profile from both a, fi a financial and talent retention perspective. Shifting gears, we engage with the community based on our student success and our research excellence in several key ways. I won't go through all of these, companies, organizations, nonprofits, but they are just the tip of the iceberg. We have hundreds of different partnerships with different organizations of all types. Here you see business, education, nonprofit, healthcare. We could go through many more. Why these are important is because of where they place our students and our faculty and staff. We have 170 different locations in which our students in education participate, educating and learning how to teach and do research in different environments. We have 180 locations in which our College of Nursing students learn about nursing, help with clinical trials, help with practice, and bring better health to society. Nursing students, faculty, and staff. We have 300 plus live theater, music, dance, and other performance events on campus and in the community. I could go through virtually every school and college and talk about how engaged this university is, critically important for the transformations that we participate in. Our students volunteer 43,000 hours in community and service learning types of projects. As a final example of engagement, I'll share with you a letter that I recently received and it's almost daily that I either receive letters or have interactions with people in the community that talk about the impact of our students, faculty, and staff. This letter is from Julie Kinzelman. She's an alumna who is now the director of the Racine Health Department's laboratory. There's a number of comments, a number of perspectives, but I'll just summarize the key idea in the lower right-hand corner. UW-Milwaukee students can and are making a difference. I've been on the road this summer and earlier in what we call the Black, Gold, and Bold Tour, engaging our alumni in different locations, some near and some far away. I give examples of the impact of our students, things like this, and it's just remarkable how many stories I hear back. And people virtually line up to talk about whether it's in Chicago, New York, Seattle, Waukesha, Appleton, or other locations. It's just tremendously powerful to hear and understand the impact of our students, the impact of our campus on our students. As I turn the corner on this people section, I think this is a useful slide and useful content to reflect on the type of support that underscores all of the areas that I've just gone through in terms of our work and impact on students, 
our research and community engagement. We're in the quiet phase of our capital campaign. We call this Vision 2020. It will help us by underscoring and reinforcing support for those things that we are trying to do more and more of every day. We've raised $83 million so far, which is a remarkable accomplishment. There are three pillars that are supported, as you can see, in terms of the work that our students are doing, especially through scholarships and fellowships, the support for faculty in their research, and support for collaborative innovators. This year, we have enlisted more than 100 campaign volunteer friends and alumni who will make gifts and help us secure gifts from others. A quick example is this week, we had a signed letter, the pledge came in from Harley Davidson to support students from every area, not every area, but a number of diverse areas on this campus for scholarships and the potential for internships at Harley Davidson. I can't tell you how excited the students were when they learned that they had met the criteria and are eligible for financial support from Harley Davidson. There's many other organizations, there's many individuals, many of you who give. By the way, this is the second highest year on record for UWM gives to UWM. Thank you and congratulations for helping us almost break the record for our own contributions. There's one other important set of comments, and this is, again, just a few examples of some of the good news, some of the things that are so important to recognize, although there's, again, so, so many others. One of the biggest, most important elements that's, that's occurred this last year is the reaccreditation of UWM from the Higher Learning Commission. This is particularly important because it recognizes and reflects positively on all that we're doing. One of the key pieces, as I talked with the president of the Higher Learning Commission in advance of the visit, when I visited with her last fall, she said, you are going to be important for some of the work that you're doing, especially in technology. There are many aspects that we consider to be important for education, and the federal government does not particularly support, through loans and other forms of support, some of the online and flexible learning that's happening. You will be an important test case, and the HLC team will be supplemented by additional members who will be giving that a very thorough review. They're some of the notable experts on technology and online learning. So we knew this was going to be important because we're a pioneer nationally. This was something that was told to me ahead of time, so I, I uh, uh, knew we would be under extreme scrutiny. We pass with flying colors and continue to serve as a role model. This will become important later on when I talk about some of the enrollment trends and other things that are going on. Our flex degrees, by the way, today have enrolled 346 students since January of 2014. Ten students have graduated, and these are in programs in the College of Nursing, School of Information Studies, and College of Health Sciences. We also have in the College of Letters and Science a certificate program in professional and technical writing. I want to tell you also about some notable accomplishments from our radio station, WWM. It received two national radio television news digital association awards in the areas of news series. There was a story on Project Milwaukee, Black Men in Prison, and continuing coverage on Dontre's death. We also just learned about a $400,000 DOE grant from U.S. Congresswoman Gwen Moore, Gwynne Moore's office where she let us know that these grants will support academic programs and departments that will support graduate fellowships for our students. There's a potential for renewal of up to $2 million. Again, recognition and reflection of all the things we're doing in people, research, and engagement. So those are all positive trends. Those are important things to recognize in terms of our purpose, why we're here, what we do, and the people who are affected and people who deliver. But I'm now in the third section where I'll talk about some of the headwinds, some of the challenges. And I want to share with you some of the things that are happening nationally. No surprises here. This is the type of trends that have been going on, we've been predicting. They are certainly re recognition of the biggest headwinds that we have really ever known in terms of higher education as a whole. The Chronicle of Higher Education reported recently some of the top worries of college presidents. What is being experienced on campuses today? 
these four areas that you can see, the decline in state financial support, competition for students, ability to raise tuition, attracting and retaining qualified faculty and staff, no surprise, no secret, that's our world. A second aspect of the report is related to the demographics, in part correlated and arguably underlying some of the things that are happening with respect to those trends that were reported by the presidents. Here's what we see, declining high school graduates in primary recruitment region. Well, what's the Wisconsin parallel? 12 percent, I'm sorry, 1,200 fewer students graduating from Wisconsin high schools for each of the last five years. What that means is that it's a zero-sum game given the existing body of colleges that occur, that, 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 that exist here in Wisconsin. If we grow, somebody else declines or vice versa. But ultimately, overall enrollment has to decline unless we can develop alternative student profiles, student populations, and other ways of delivering education. Lower socioeconomic status of, of applicants, declining middle, cla middle, cl middle class, and changing racial and ethnic mix. I apologize. That, that, uh, <laughs> I, I will not be too Bernie Sanders-ish. I will not, not be too, too um, gesturing here. So, so those are the national perspectives, and I want to use an hourglass type of approach where we talk at the national level and bring it increasingly into what does this mean for UWM. As you know, in the last two budget, campus budget forum meetings in July and August, I, I shared this slide, and I'll just show in, in brief what on the left side could have been and then what has happened. And so this is the world that we're in in terms of the nature and the impact of just the budget portion of the cut. And the bottom line on the right-hand side shows the gravity. In a way, this is the tale of two worlds. This is, well, the cut's a lot better than it could have been, but it's still forcing us to grapple with something that's of a magnitude we've certainly never grappled with. So that puts us in a very, very challenging situation. There are additional details. All of the slides, all of the content that's been presented, as well as live streaming on our website, uwm.edu slash budget if you're interested. This presentation, by the way, will also be put uh, forward on my website. Let's delve into this in even more detail. If we didn't have the budget cut, we would still have this problem that I want to share with you more detail about today. We're facing a campus-wide structural deficit projected to be about 30 million. It could be a little more, it could be a little less. But at this point, the best projection we have is about $30 million. What that means is that we're bringing in, on an annual basis, that much less than what we're spending. Hold out for a moment, what are our reserves? How much do we have in the bank? But basically what this says is that on an annual basis, our revenues are under our expenses by $30 million. To put this in context, in the context of our larger budget, so that you appreciate the size of what we're talking about, this is the size of the budgets of the College of Nursing, Information Studies, and Engineering combined. That's the magnitude of this. We need to provide some context and talk about how did we get here? What's, what's responsible? Where, 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 where's the background on this? Let me first of all describe some common factors across all of UW system. The common factors are the first two that are listed there. Budget cuts for four consecutive biennial budgets. Four-year tuition freeze. I'll talk in more detail about the significance of that alone. UWM specifically, though, has five unique factors, including significant, significant capital and program commitments. These were areas that we've expanded and purchased, things that we've done, such as the Kenwood IRC, such as the Northwest Quad, Zilber School of Public Health, Innovation Campus, South, or School of Freshwater Sciences. These are important areas to recognize that at the time, how much since the decisions made, they were part of larger um, plans that, that had been uh, undertaken. We peaked in terms of enrollment in 2010 with about 30,400 students. We declined through 2014. We stabilized last year. We may decline a bit this year. So we have declining enrollment. By the way, that alone accounts for $20 million in base budget over those four years alone from 2010 to 2014. That, that's the magnitude of those enrollment declines. As you know, 
we, UWM, have been underfunded relative to other UW system institutions, not all of them, but certainly relative to Madison and other areas we need to, to uh, address. And then our reserves have declined. And so we look at the future and we say, we have a different scenario facing us than what we need to have. So this is quite challenging. Let me provide a little more perspective on the structural deficit. I would anticipate, if I were you, some questions. I would, I would want to know some of these perspectives. So let me share with you a few things. The deficit didn't just happen this year. It is not the responsibility, well, it is the responsibility of all of us, but it is not a symptom of decisions that have been made in the last year or two. In fact, they go back at least a decade. And why I say that is that there were decisions around the Milwaukee Initiative and commitments that were made during previous governor, previous campus administration that were collectively committed to in terms of the state, the community, donors, and UWM that said, we are going to go into these different areas and make a difference, and we are. And we must continue with those areas. They're critical to the future of our campus, our students, the region, and beyond. The rationale at the time was very sound. In fact, new revenue was and still is anticipated in many of those areas. They're the right thing to have done. But we had this perfect storm of events. The tuition freeze. Let me talk just for a moment about that. From 2003 through 2012, we had an average of 6.8% tuition increase. If we had half of that, if we had less than half of that over the last four years, 3%, not even half of the 6.8, we would have a $30 million base operating budget increase over where we are today. That alone is a significant factor. And if you want to know, well, how did the structural deficit get here? It didn't happen overnight. This is something that was a, a function of a set of decisions and events that have occurred. So that alone is significant, the tuition freeze. Budget cuts, as noted, have been substantial. Last year, we had an $8 million budget cut. This year, because of the reprieve, our budget cut was only in the neighborhood of 13 to 14, but the base budget cut going forward is $18 million. So that's huge, as well as the previous ones. The commitments that had we had the $20 million that at the time the regents, the legislature, and others supported, this was in the 2006, 7, and 8 period, we would have 20 million more. We got the first $10 million done, we didn't get the next two. But again, those are huge factors. Think about what a different scenario any one of those could have made, the historical underfunding. So any two of those could have been sustained, but the problem is we're dealing with a confluence of significant unexpected events in many ways. So what have we been doing? The next few slides are a narrative of what are we doing and what will we do going forward. How are we handling this? Upon learning of the potential budget cuts, we have worked with a series of groups, and I'll talk through those and share some slides that describe how they work, around cost containment that remain in place today. We're hiring only necessary positions. We are putting a hold on out-of-state travel with exceptions for grant and gift-funded travel, and that for research and academic purposes. We used this year the Voluntary Separation Incentive Plan. We're in the process of addressing a number of other steps that will be taken. Our budget activities, in terms of the work and where it's happening, encompass a lot of different activities. I won't go through all of these, but I'd draw your attention to the bottom line. And many of you probably see yourself, by the way, in these different activities, know the types of things that we're involved with. We've had almost 250 meetings, including the work in the spring and through the summer, that have been to plan, to make decisions, to communicate, to advocate, to do a number of things to help manage through these. And I don't share these because the volume is important. I share these to show the communication efforts, the transparency, and the inclusion with which we've tried to bring people together to understand some of the most significant issues we have ever faced. I think it is important to stress again that while we're really dealing with a budget cut, and that's what a lot of this is responsive to, there are larger, deeper, ongoing issues that also need to be addressed, namely the structural deficit. 
what we've been doing and how we've been doing it is depicted in a simple picture here. I will build on this picture. It'll get a little more complex as I go through these. So this is foundational. We have formed early this year and even though we didn't know what the budget cut was going to be, we had to start planning. It would have been irresponsible not to, given the size of a proposed $300 million cut. The Budget Planning Task Force and the Budget Communication Task Force were formed early in 2015, and they work in collaboration with the Budget Model Working Group that's been in place for two years. That group will be using this year for input, for piloting ideas to be put in place in fiscal 2016. This work has been guided by the strategic directions. We have continued to try to focus as we look at this on our priorities around student success, research excellence, community engagement, our culture and climate, our visibility, brand and image. Let me depict these a little bit differently. You can see what we have here is simply taking the same groups and arraying our strategic directions on those. So I have to tell you this is a good start, but it isn't enough. We have managed this year's cuts and we have plans in place for how we would address just the budget cuts for next year through the work that's happening with these groups in conjunction with our, our uh, uh, different groups on campus, including our schools and colleges and other administrative groups and governance. What I want to talk about more today is something that I've mentioned in the last two budget forum, campus budget forums. In the July meeting, I talked about this as the campus transformation team. In the last meeting, I described this as what it is known as now, the camp Chancellor's Campus Organization and Effectiveness Team. On the blue box on the right-hand side, there's some details, and I'll, I'll spend, spend some time going through these. The team sponsors are myself, the Provost and Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administrative Affairs. We met with the team co-chairs earlier this week to talk about the charge and to provide a draft of all the members and to finalize things. Bob Greenstreet, one of our campus's senior deans, he's the Dean of School of Architecture and Urban Planning, and John Reisel, the University Committee Chair, will be the co-chairs of this primary team. There will be a support team, which is chaired by Paula Reiner, who's of School of Continuing Ed and College of Health Science, and Kyle Swanson, who's the department chair in mathematics and in the faculty on Letter College of Letters and Science. This team size will be about 12 people. These members will be joined by students, faculty, staff, deans, and cabinet members. If we advance and go further, this is, this is what we are, are, are working on, and putting this together, this team with some of the other groups on our campus, I bring in today our schools and colleges, wh whose work will be guided and directed in conjunction with these planning teams, and shared governance. Shared governance underlies all that we are aiming to accomplish, as do the schools and colleges work. We've gained feedback from all our governance groups for the membership of the Chancellor's Campus Organization and Effectiveness Team, and we'll continue to stay engaged with them. A little more detail on a team that some have said, Mark, you need to work on that acronym. COET just doesn't quite work very well, so a little help from the marketing folks. I see some colleagues who might be able to, to help there. This was based on one of the key recommendations from the Budget Planning Task Force and governance groups in terms of their recommendations on the membership and charge of the group. The charge specifically is to develop recommendations and a plan that will improve the organization and effectiveness of our campus to do these three things. Propose meaningful large-scale efficiencies, consolidation of organizational units, and outline other improvements or priorities. Their initial task is to recommend a process for campus engagement. Why is that so critical? By early October, to be able to share with the campus a plan for how everybody will be engaged and inclusion will be a high priority. Because there's no way that we could construct a team that has a small enough group to be able to meet regularly and make some of the necessary recommendations, drawing from others, and be supported by a team of 12 people that collectively, those 27 represent every 
stakeholder on and off our campus. It simply wouldn't be possible. We have 5,300 employees, 27 to 28,000 students. We simply couldn't have a group that has representation from every sector and still work effectively. But this group, through their plan, will develop a way that we can bring forward the ideas, the best and the brightest ideas that we have. So these are the things that we have to work on to ultimately better serve our students, southeastern Wisconsin and beyond. Let me answer one other question that might be in mind. Why do we really need this group? Most of the current planning of existing groups is narrow, relatively speaking. It's got a one to two year time frame and it is not looking campus wide. It's focused oftentimes within schools and drawing from the planning within schools, college, and support or administrative units. We really need, in the context of the challenges facing our campus, larger transformation to meet the substantial challenges and meet our strategic objectives. Let's stand back and think about where this campus has been going for the last several years prior to this last fall. Again, remember, we were looking at a $90 million increase. That was going to translate in at our 13% into substantial increases, and we were hoping that we would have a, pre, a, a reprieve from the budget or the, the tuition freeze that had been in place. There were some very good indicators of, of positive progress. It was a very different scenario. Today, we don't have that, and all those other factors have combined to create a significant challenge. And we need to stand back and say, at the burn rate or at the rate of our structural deficit, we had a $90 million reserve as recently as a year to a year and a half ago. Today, we have 61 million. At a structural deficit rate of 30 million, we have about two years before the lines cross. That's the challenge that we're facing. So how do we, how do we, we position ourselves? And that's what this third point is about. How do we best draw from the ideas that are here, the best minds, the best ideas to, to position UWM for future campus success? and meet our strategic objectives of keeping our priorities intact. So this team embraces the existing budget planning and shared governance and will operate with urgency. I'm asking for October to have a plan for how we will move forward and by February to have some recommendations that I will evaluate at that point and share with the campus. So moving ahead, how can, how do we move ahead in light of the challenges that we face. Let me first remember and ask us all to first remember the size and magnitude of this remarkable enterprise we call UW-Milwaukee. Given our core education, research, and engagement roles, we matter more than ever. This is why it's so critical that we preserve tenure and shared governance and support our academic and university staff. Our people, our students, faculty, and staff make things happen. I need to fight as strongly as possible to protect tenure, shared governance, and support indefinite status and other policies that are crucial to the value of our employees. Let me develop these ideas that you see in front of you a little bit more. There are some brief updates on the collaborative work that we're doing to move us ahead. First, the Tenure Policy Task Force was created in anticipation of needing a Board of Regents policy on tenure. This is a UW system tenure policy task force. The final budget changed the statutes and regulations on tenure and layoffs, so a Board of Regent policy is needed. For now, tenure policies exist in the Board of Regent policy, which includes the exact wording from the previous statutory language. UW-Milwaukee has two representatives on this task force. Rob Smith from History, and Christine Serreras from the Chemistry and Biochemistry Departments. Their first meeting was held on August 20th, 2015. I received today an update from that meeting, and I'd be happy to share it with you. This is written by one of the chancellors on his blog post that I just received today, uh, Jim Schmidt from Eau Claire. During the Q&A, if you're interested, he gives some specifics and some reports on this. The goal of this task force was to have policies and practices that are consistent with the AAUP. In light of the challenges that have arisen with tenure, 
AAUP chapter has emerged on campus. This was formed this summer. I look forward to working with them and establishing shared governance and established shared governance groups on these issues. Our campus must strive to comport with AAU principles and policies. It's also important for you to know that the UW System Tenure Policy Task Force is working closely with the AAUP as well. I'm also working together with academic staff governance and UW System on indefinite status and other issues of importance to our academic staff. I continue to meet with our university staff and welcome all the participation of our governance groups. Beyond those foundational areas for how we move ahead, there are further examples that I'd like to mention in passing, not in great detail, but tell you a few examples of the great things that are going on. There was this summer, by support of the provost office, an academic staff development retreat. The members who attended that retreat formed a group called Panthers for Positive Change. I joined this group for a while to offer my comments and perspectives and talk a little bit about what they're learning and reinforce that, if I could. And they came up with this idea to talk about ways in which they can improve the campus climate and culture through discussion, not just with other academic staff, but to engage the faculty and university staff and to have collaborative discussions. And they asked for more support and more type of in individuals to be able to attend that. The provost and I have, have discussed this and find that this is a very important and very, very uh, instrumental thing to continue to support. Solution Central is an initiative that we have put forward to promote things, solutions, ideas that will address educational attainment and achievement gap in Milwaukee. We've got some initial funding from the UW system that was just confirmed in the last few weeks for $300,000 that will be matched, depending on the outcomes, by another $300,000 from UW system. We have been bringing together individuals on our campus around what we're calling the social compact modeled on the campus compact nationally. This is to look at and focus some of our efforts on this campus around social justice, social entrepreneurship, and equity issues. Another activity that has really picked up a lot of steam and momentum is what we call M-Cubed. M-Cubed is a collaboration between UW-Milwaukee, Milwaukee Area Technical College, and Milwaukee Public Schools to prepare K-12 students for post-secondary education and jobs. In a nutshell, it's a pipeline that will bring more students into higher education, but more fundamentally, we're working together on graduation for MPS as a foundation to support MATC and UWM ultimately, but all institutions of higher education, and more importantly, this region to help with that. Bradley Tech is simply one manifestation of the work that M-Cubed is doing together. For background, it was more than 14 years ago that we actually signed a pact with MATC and MPS, an, an agreement to work collaboratively to form a commission to run Bradley Tech, long one of the most fabled tech schools in the state. It was, used to be a Milwaukee Tech Boys School. This school has had some significant challenges over the years, and we've reaffirmed our commitment and have a number of individuals on our campus who are today engaged to help with the Greater Milwaukee Committee and industry to improve this technology and trade school. Our legislative activity continues. We've met in the last several weeks with three members of Joint Finance Committee, including its co-chair, Senator Alberta Darling. They want to continue to try to find ways to support the work that we're doing on this campus, and we're putting together a request for the yet this year, as well as additional requests for future operating and capital budgets. And next, I'll share some brief comments on our Entrepreneurship Center, which will wrap up our talk on progressing together. This summer, we announced a gift from Shell and Marianne Lubar, equaling their earlier $10 million gift to establish the Lubar Center for Entrepreneurship as well as a campus welcome center. This gift is representing something that is new and unprecedented in the context of having a $10 million match for the building portion, which is estimated today to be at around $8 million. So what this means 
is that there will be an endowment with a commitment to raise another $5 million that will generate funds for the operating. By having the joint commitment of the system and that of our wonderful donors, the Lubars, we have a very positive path going forward from a financial perspective. This is a powerful example of faith, of U faith in UWM by members in the community and our system to know how we can make a difference. This effort is multidisciplinary. While today entrepreneurship covers seven or eight different schools and colleges, we want to have every school and college represented from students, faculty, and staff. It's critical not just to help start companies and not just to launch new ideas, whether it's in education or in the arts or engineering or business or any number of social entrepreneurship types of areas, but to be able to be entrepreneurial, creative, and innovative in any type of setting. And the Entrepreneurship Center is aimed at that. We have a lot of ideas that are currently happening on campus in entrepreneurship. Stu student Startup Challenge, with 300 students applying over the last three years, this year working in 10 different project teams. Fresh Ideas, something to engage freshmen in entrepreneurial activities across this fall, six classes in different schools and colleges. We have 175 students who have expressed a strong interest in entrepreneurship from just our freshman class alone on their pre-college survey. Let me offer now a final word from our students. I'm definitely excited to get back here to UWM for the fall. I'm super excited to get back to campus. It's my last year, I'll be graduating, and it's gonna be a great year. Once everyone gets back here, the campus is going all the time and there's so much stuff to do. Fall welcome is amazing. Everyone's excited, everyone's pumped, we're all here and going to events with each other and making new friends. It's really a time for our new students and our returning students to get acclimated back to campus and you really get to make meaningful social connections. It's going to be a very busy year. I'm very excited to start my professional major of nursing. It's pretty competitive so getting in is a very big deal. During my first year I will be in a clinical rotation so we'll be going to a long-term healthcare facility. I'm just very excited to really get out into the community and really start learning those skills that I need to become an awesome nurse. I leave for my study abroad in three weeks and I'm heading to Prague. I'm super excited, especially to see more of the Eastern European culture. I've always had that wanderlust and just wanted to explore. It's just really cool to see what people think and how they act and live over there and how I can kind of relate it back to my major. I'm really excited to get back into the whole filmmaking process. So I got an internship here with the media department and I kind of go to the games and I film them or I pick the highlights for them. It's a really good opportunity for me to get hands-on work with equipment and with microphones. I'm pretty much going to be at every UWM game now because if I'm not going to be cheering at the game, I'll probably be filming it. When I first started here at UW-Milwaukee, I was very interested in commercial architecture, uh, which eventually switched to residential architecture. I got involved with Milwaukee Homegrown through my Architecture 350 class. I am currently working with them to design a watershed or a rain shed for the Milwaukee communities. Because of UWM, I've really been able to see what kind of study abroads are out there and really develop myself as a professional. I think I'll be very prepared to tackle any population when I go into the nursing field to work with any patient. I really found an interest and a love for working with communities and especially those who are underserved. Everyone here, all the faculty, all the students are waiting for me to succeed and are going to be with me every step of the way. I am so panther proud and I literally bleed black and gold. I literally bleed black and gold. How do you like that? Isn't that great? <laughs> I was over in the park last night and I saw a person say uh, on their shirt, I, I uh, bleed uh, green and gold. They're a Green Bay Packers shirt. And I said, our students beat you. So, so uh, it's good. So these students and all of our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and partners are the driving force of why I'm energized to be here. And at our core, our students are the reason we are all here, and that gives us focus. I couldn't be more proud. Let me briefly recap the key points that I've tried to make today in this plenary. I've reaffirmed our central purpose, which is around education, research, and engagement. I've underscored our people, the students, faculty, and staff role in delivering those areas. 
explain the, diff the significance of the challenges in front of us and describe the details on our plan for moving ahead. Chancellor's campus organization and effectiveness team, the budget planning, the importance of shared governance, our schools and colleges, putting forward tenure, working with the AAUP and all our groups. I've also shared many positive features going forward of this important campus and our work together. I want to thank you for your service and commitment. I ask for your help, for your patience, and your understanding that none of us asked for or created this fiscal and political scenario. But we have to manage it, and we will. I need and I value your help. And with 5,300 people that work here and over 27,000 students, this is a tall order. I appreciate you being here and listening today, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks. Yes. Richard Leeson, Art History. I have a question about GPR. Um, it seems like uh, GPR is being discussed uh, more lately. Um, I noticed that you uh, touched upon it at the last budget meeting uh, uh, closer to the end of this summer. And you just uh, mentioned that you're going to be meeting with Alberta Darling, uh, members of the Joint Finance Committee. It sounded like to discuss uh, allocations. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is being done to address the uh, historic, I think, uh, 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 disproportionate allotment of funds uh, to UWM? And I say that not asking that I think that we should uh, be funded uh, such uh, that it, it damages or hurts the other institutions that are part of the UW system, uh, but because it seems as, uh, as we are such a powerful generator of learning and employment in the state of Wisconsin that uh, we should be uh, treated a little bit more fairly. Well, first, I couldn't agree with you more. And I want to talk about this in two different ways. One that I didn't talk about enough, and thank you for reminding me because I think I had the point on my slide, but I didn't talk about the tuition task force. I shared with the group in the campus budget forum a few weeks ago that I've been asked to serve on the tuition task force for UW system. Why this is so important, when we talked about being in the context of should I be on the tenured policy task force, which already has a number of chancellors, or this one, where I will be either the only chancellor or one of two, this is critically important because Regent Tim Higgins is the chair of this, and one of the areas that will be explored is exactly this issue, the funding allocation model. In other words, it starts with the top line, tuition, but then Ultimately, how is tuition allocated across the system schools? I can tell you that I've had discussions with President Cross, and he recognizes the underfunding of UW-Milwaukee relative to our peers. And I can't say that he is committed to changing that and increasing it, but he is um, committed to opening this discussion up. And of course, the Regents uh, Task Force that will be looking at this provides ample opportunity, and I'm reasonably confident that with the legislature having recognized exactly what you're talking about and all the discussions that I'm having with regents, legislators, and others, that UW-Milwaukee has, has a, a future that, that looks very promising with regard to GPR and base budget. It's critical for our future. Even if we only had 500 more per student, what a difference that would make in terms of the funding. I'm not talking about increasing tuition for students. I'm talking about how those funds are distributed and allocated. Now, the second piece of this, so that I'm, I'm actually very encouraged by, just given the, the way that, that I've been hearing and, and, and had discussions with President Cross about the, the indicators for us. The second piece of this is with regard to the specific planning and the requests that I'm making working directly with our UW system, Ray Cross. When I had my annual evaluation meeting midsummer with him, and we talked about the ideal operating budget for UW-Milwaukee, and I made the case for us to have a 30 to $50 million increase in base budget. He challenged me to put together a model and a plan for how we will achieve the ideal that we need to have with regard to our operating budget. And in part of that is the big request that I'm making for the funding allocation model to be changed specifically to support that. 
So there's a lot of work that's been going on behind the, the planning that ultimately the organization effectiveness team will help develop. How do we build on and demonstrate a strong case for justifying, the, given the things that we're doing, that, that change? So between the request directly for that and then the work through this tuition task force, I'm um, not gonna be overly optimistic, but those are the things that I'm doing working as well with our legislators to continue to build the case. We've had 63 visits with legislators this year. 63 visits in which we are making specific asks and showing them, and it's not just our own visits, but it's having a lot of additional people work on our behalf that aren't included as part of those 63. And I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of people who recognize and, 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 and have sent the message forward. I think it's fair to say, when you look at the, the results of the budget, this is the first time out of those one-time funds that UW-Milwaukee got 29% of the funds that were allocated. This year, 20 million in one-time funds were released. We got 29%. Madison, in comparison, got maybe a fourth of that. Other campuses, no more. No campuses got into the double digits. In addition, the cut was further because of exactly those, those drivers. So I'm, I'm reasonably somewhat optimistic about, about our chances. I can't be overconfident on this. It's just tough. But that's the critically important thing. So yeah, thanks for asking that. Yes? At the Milwaukee Fellows luncheon on Tuesday, the Lieutenant Governor stressed um, MACT, uh, the technical colleges, as a primary solution to workforce um, issues. I, I'm cheered by the, the M3 uh, uh, um, effort that you described, but I still think, um, you know, it, it may be that the technical colleges are a threat to um, four-year colleges, doctoral universities, such as uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I, I just wonder how, if, if that figures into the thinking that you have, uh, do you see it as a problem or what? Um, do you mean a threat because of the funding that may be accrued, that, that may divert funding? Students going there. Let me, let me share with you, um, clearly, clearly, if it were only there, and it were just technical colleges, and they stopped with terminal degrees, that, that could be a threat. Um, but a couple, a couple thoughts that, that have occurred to us as, as we've been very much involved with this. We had heard that MPS students go to the tune of 50 or 55% on to MATC or UWM. And I'm working pretty closely with Dr. Darian Driver, the superintendent of MPS, and I said, Darian, give me a fact check on that. That just seems a little, little high, <laughs> a lot high. She said, Mark, it's almost 70% of MPS students that go on to MATC or UWM. Now, we have done the numbers. We don't see that directly from MPS direct to UWM, but the channel that they are coming through, because Vicki Martin, the president of MATC, showed me the numbers and she said, you're, you're the largest recipient of our graduates. More people go on to UWM from MATC than any other two year, than any other four year institution. Now, if you think about the magnitude of students in the area, MPS, MATC and UWM together represent 143 or 144,000 students. We're huge in terms of the pipeline and what we can do together. So at least locally here, I'm not too worried. We, we, I think, can benefit from that. Now, there's another movement afoot, and that is something we don't know a lot about, and that's the potential merger, you know, what the legislature is discussing across the two-year technical and vocational. So we've got system college, you've got the UW colleges, and the technical school that now the Republican legislature is looking at. And I know as much as you do about this. I have no inside knowledge. Um, there is a UW system staff meeting tomorrow with all the chancellors and uh, Ray Cross. And I'll probably know more. We'll hear an update. But at this point, I know what you know in terms of in the newspaper where 
Robin Voss, the um, uh, legislative leader, has been um, working on this. That, that will have potential funding implications, but potentially big cost savings. There's one other angle on this, and that is if you look at Georgia State and if you look at some other creative schools, when we look at student retention issues, what are the threats to our students continuing? Both retention and graduation, they usually come down to two areas, financial capability and academic preparation. We, we, have, we have issues in both those areas, and that's not unique to UWM. But what other school, one in particular, Georgia State, has found is this college within a college model, and they've incorporated a two-year program that's a pathway that works on a lot of the remedial education for those students who need it that then accelerates their, their progress into four-year at a lower price point. Now, let me, let me say we're not there. Think of the implications from a revenue perspective, first of all. We don't want to jump into that quickly. But students on average pay $10,000 a year at UWM just for tuition alone, and they graduate with a $29,000 student debt load. If we can help with that by some college within a college type of model, think creatively and think about gradually moving into that, this could be huge. And if we can look at other factors that would help reduce the, the debt load. So those are some things that, that, that we're working with. And one of the big pieces of this, and where we're looking at support, is through scholarships and financial support from large foundations. So that's part of our planning with respect to M cubed and the support is to help with that pipeline. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, and she's a big fan of ours, by the way. We've had, we've, yeah, she's, she's very supportive of the work that we're doing, and I think, I think um, has, has um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're pleased by that. We need all the help we can get, you know, Republican, Democratic, um, <laughs> across, across the whole legislative body. By the way, one of the things that we are working on specifically and deliberately is going to every legislative leader and talking especially outside of the Milwaukee, southeastern Wisconsin region, and really getting the outstate support. That's got to be critical because we drive the state. Sheila Harsdorf up in the northwestern part, she's, she's the leader of the higher education caucus and the group within the legislature. She asked me, and I apologize if I've said this before, I know some of you have probably heard this, but she asked me, how can we get Milwaukee to become like the Twin Cities and really help the state grow? I said, UWM. Support UWM. And I can go to every legislative leader. Thank you. I can go to every legislative leader, and we do, and we talk about the alumni in their region, and we talk about the current students in their region, and we talk about the experiences specific to them. It's pretty powerful stuff, but thank you for your question, Tim. Yes, sir. Um, uh, thank you, Chancellor Mooney. Um, I'm Jamie Harris, Urban Studies. I just have a few prepared comments and a request I'd like to make. Um, I don't want this to be something of a downer, but um, this is a, a very challenging time um, for everyone on campus. Um, and I think, sadly, this has become really the new normal. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and fear about um, what the future holds. Um, I do want to thank you for your um, uh, public comments and commitment to shared governance and tenure and indefinite status and fighting for UWM. Um, but was, uh, as was stated in the last budget meeting, um, due to this budget, there's going to be a number of people let go um, on the order of perhaps 200 to 300. Uh, and we know that there's a good deal of uh, restructuring and budget cutting that's going on through um, all these different committees that you uh, discussed. And so um, one of the requests that I'd like to make, and this is really part of um, the newly formed AAU chapter on campus, uh, which is representing faculty, academic staff, and graduate students at UWM, uh, is to make retaining personnel um, one of the highest priorities. Um, as you said, we didn't ask for this. Uh, it's not because we're not a lean university. It's not because the, the work we do isn't powerful and wonderful and making a strong impact in Milwaukee. Uh, it's really part of downsizing the state university system. Um, but with that said, clearly this budget is huge and people will uh, have to go. So 
to commit to that, uh, to making that really the very last resort. And then related to that, when people are let go, um, as this goes forward with campus restructuring and budget cuts, that both the administration and individual departments uh, treat those terminations as layoffs, not as um, uh, non-renewals. Um, and this is, this is really important because, um, as you know, layoff entitles uh, an employee to a whole set of rights and benefits, such as um, uh, uh, re reassignment that's possible, um, later recall if the position opens up, and of course, um, access to uh, unemployment insurance benefits. And so I think as UWM is striving to be the best place to work, uh, that this is really the, the, the only ethical position um, that the university can take regarding these budget cut induced terminations. So um, we ask you today to commit to these principles and to pledge to follow existing UWM policy on layoffs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so certainly, certainly there's, there's no question about the importance and priority of people. And we're gonna do everything we can to preserve all our positions that we possibly can. I think as you can appreciate from the magnitude of the situation, and you've acknowledged you know, as we go through um, the, the position evaluations, as we look at the structure, as we look at department by department um, where we're at, um, we, we will be in a, a challenging situation with people being the majority of our budget in terms of the, the, the largest single factor. So we may well have to go into to, um, layoffs or non-renewals. I'm working very closely with the Academic Staff Committee today on this issue, and we're meeting, uh, in fact, Vice Chancellor Van Harpen and um, our, our Provost Brits, myself, are meeting with five members of the academic staff. And I don't know if we have that meeting next week, I, I think it's set up for next week, uh, where we're discussing and continuing our discussion exactly around those issues. Um, it's rather complicated, and it can't be binary. I wanna find a middle ground very importantly, to your point about uh, the retention and doing everything we can to, to preserve employment for our employees, what we're trying to do is, is put in place a program that would give people um, all of the conditions, everything associated with what a layoff provides in terms of educational, I'm sorry, employment opportunities in, in any number of areas across UWM to try to find ways that we can preserve the talent, the great people that we've got. Um, but I can't say today that we will just unilaterally go with layoff. There's some, some um, issues that are involved that make it rather difficult to do that uh, right, off, right off, off, you know, off hand to do that. Yes, hi, hey, up there, sorry. Sure. Um, so there's really two issues. One is with regard to the comments and mechanisms for engaging the campus, whether it's with the organization and effectiveness team or whether it's with our current budget issues and how do we get input to, to those groups. I want to remind everybody that on the Budget Planning Task Force website, 
there is um, a place for suggestions and recommendations and questions. And we have been fielding those um, routinely. And we've, we've been building and, and in bringing a lot of those suggestions forward. And many of them have been incorporated as the group has been planning. I want to build well beyond that um, with the organization and effectiveness team. And that's why it's such an important mandate to develop a plan by early October that I will share with the campus. And this plan will be something that we will look at and say, is this a plan that does exactly what you're requesting, Gene? Make sure that it's more than a listening session. Make sure that it's more than a website. How do we specifically engage the different groups on our campus to make sure there is inclusion as we go down that path? On your second point about the um, best place to work committee, that when I had been leading it and moved into the interim chancellor role, I still um, hung on to that for a short while and then asked one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Ramala Singh, she had been the interim point person in terms of the chancellor's designee for, for uh, best place to work. We're, this summer, we had uh, a retreat that had governance group representatives and the chancellor's cabinet. This is the expanded cabinet retreat. And we had what we call panther teams. And we looked at every one of the strategic initiatives and we said, what's happening in each of these areas and what's a short term recommendation and plan for what we need to do to move the needle? Where should this be owned? It was time, it was determined by this group that BP2W, or Best Place to Work, first of all, the name. You tell me how many people like the name Best Place to Work for the climate team. I don't see a lot of hands, right? So, so right away, we know that, that that name is a challenge, and the whole underlying premise needs to be reexamined. So we have a group that is working on that that's comprised of cabinet and governance members that by the deadline, Sue, help me out, September 11th, there will be a concrete plan for what should be the key goals, where should this reside, how should it continue. And by the way, across the five areas, the Panther teams, let me just give you a quick recap. With respect to student success, you know who should own that. We don't need to create another team or group. This is CMAT. This is the Chancellor's Enrollment Management Action Team. On research, what we have done is we've reestablished the top tier research university team that will continue their work. Mark Harris has brought those together, our Vice Provost for Research, Interim Vice Provost Mark, has been bringing that group together and we have virtually everybody engaged in bringing that forward. That will be a critical input for the work that we do on organization and effectiveness. With, regret, with respect to community engagement and partnerships, we have a group that's working on, on that, that's, that's um, doing a, a short-term focus team. Best Place to Work has a team on that, and then Visibility, Brand, and Image, a team. So that, some of those teams are long-term and ongoing, and some of those teams are short, focused, and discreet, and will disband after we determine where this goes. So a little larger than, than just BP2W, but that's, that's the future of, of uh, where we're at with that. Well, no, they're, they're determining what, where do we go with best place to work? Where do we go with respect? What's the group that should own this? Philosophically, there are some who would say, this really should be owned at the school and college level. Do we need a central group that's working on this? Where should it, you know, where, 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 where is it managed? What are the types of resources that are involved with it? Who should be on it? So this group is, is identifying what's the plan for going forward, okay? Okay. We've had some folks leaving, but uh, yes, another question. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Fleischer. I uh, teach in the linguistics department, and I'm also uh, affiliated with the AAUP chapter that was created here this summer. Um, I appreciate you acknowledging the creation of the chapter. Um, and I'm also heartened to hear your comments of, of supporting uh, academic freedom and tenure and shared governance um, and your commitment to AAUP principles. Um, one specific question I have is, you know, as we get ready to face these cuts, um, I I'm curious how you, uh, what your plans are for maintaining AAUP standards, shared governance practices as decisions are made. I'm um, thinking in particular of the, the fact that AAUP guidelines specify that faculty play a primary role in decisions about program modification or discontinuance. Well, the, the um, answer that I think is most direct is that 
as we're making decisions and going forward, it's, it's really with faculty in terms of the programmatic curriculum types of decisions and, and, and areas, um, we, we, it's, it's pretty hard to implement, teach, research uh, without, without the endorsement of the people who are doing it. So I want this to be collaborative. I want this to be something where we have, we have the involvement and the engagement of our faculty and shared governance groups from academic staff, university staff as we proceed. What we're up against and, and what we have to realize is because of the situation as I described it is we, we have to have urgency. So we have to move in a collaborative but also quick manner. So we have to find the right balance to move ahead uh, simply because at the rate of the deficit spending and our available reserves, given those other factors, it's simply difficult for us to take more than, more than the next three to six months to, to really move ahead. But I don't see, when we get through this, the um, organization and effectiveness team at a certain point, whether it's in three months or six months, saying, well, AAUP and shared governance and academic freedom and, and, and all, all the tenets that we're talking about today going away. In fact, Rachel Ida Buff, professor in history, is on the chancellor's um, campus organization and effectiveness team. I believe she's the president of the, the chapter. Um, so that will help uh, tremendously, I believe, uh, with respect to that. Okay. Well, any other questions, comments? How about if we have a reception? Thank you again. Okay.